Hey mates, welcome back to the My Mate podcast. Uh, this week I thought I'd actually bring another chapter from the upcoming audiobook. So uh, this is going to be chapter five now. So last week you listened to uh, the Mushrooms Saga on Schoolies. This weekend, well I, I'm assuming, I'm not sure when you're going to be listening to it, but maybe in your commute tomorrow morning, um, Monday morning that is for all our overseas listeners. Uh, tomorrow, and this, this episode is all going to be about um, me coming to understand what a panic attack uh, was at the time and is now. Uh, speaking to my psychologist in 2014, um, I received pretty intensive psychology work from about January to, to, to July 2014. And I guess what the mushrooms brought up for me and you know me kind of working through a bit more introspection was the idea that there were some issues from the past that I hadn't reconciled. And that was all coming up in you know at the same time as um, some external volatility, volatile situations as well. So uh, I think we all go through, through, you know, go through this sort of stuff. It seems like when one thing happens, everything happens, you know. And, and how do we deal with that? And chapter five is is all about how I kind of dealt with that stuff at the time. And you know, I really believe in 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 mental health tools. You know, I don't think we are entitled to adequate mental health. I think we have to work hard on it, you know, just like going to the gym. We're not entitled to a very good looking fit body. We have to work hard to get that. So is the same with mental health. We need to make sure that we're being honest with ourselves, honest with other people, you make sure that we're aware of who we are, at least to a certain degree, and how we orientate ourselves effectively in, in, in our in our worlds. And we have to surround ourselves with people that want the best for us. And sometimes Wanting the best for us means that they're actually able to have those difficult conversations with us as well. So this is what this chapter is all about. I sincerely hope you enjoy it, guys, and I'll speak to you after the show. The Pale Blue Dot. Chapter 5. Panic Attacks and Counselling. Rock Bottom. One of the most intriguing concepts I have come to grasp in relation to anxiety is that it can rise and fall and gradually set and reset at different degrees of intensity based on surroundings or perceived levels of danger. One can assume a child in a war-torn country, enslaved by a dictator for example, may have a higher set level of anxiety than a child living in a democratic first world nation. After the mushrooms, my anxiety was set to face death every time I turned a corner. I was in a constant state of panic, analysing literally everything around me and regarding everything anyone said to me as a potential threat. With hindsight, these times are more fascinating to me than any other. Again, I was still me, just a highly alert me, ready to face danger, or more likely, ready to run away from danger at any given moment. Nevertheless, the analytical processes anxiety puts in place is what's most alluring. I'd hazard a guess that if my life played out like a movie and was celebrated at an awards ceremony, the accolade for the most creative and analytical moment in my life would be presented to that eight-hour mushroom trip I experienced. I'd like to thank my mum and dad for this award. Even though I was highly diagnostic and generally tense in the months and years that followed, nothing could outweigh those eight harrowing hours. And again, looking back, it was more the, the first hour, the second hour as well, that was just highly, highly um, stricken with anxiety. And the, the, you know, the, the rest of the night was just completely overwhelming. And as we know, yeah, well, we know how it unfolded. <laughs> Stream of consciousness. I've often wondered about the relationship between stress and creativity. Anxiety is an emotion which can heighten your sensitivity to surroundings on the basis of prospective danger. It is an evolved sense. It makes you highly aware and can cause physical sensations such as an elevated heart rate, warmer skin, blood rushes to the skin, and a rise in adrenaline levels. After some time, these physical sensations may reduce. However, the thoughts, that is the what-ifs, and mental alertness may not. I believe this is the toughest stage of an anxiety disorder. Ironically, this stage is more apparent towards the end when recovery from chronic anxiety is looming. Just when you thought it was all said and done, anxiety slaps you in the face one final time. Furthermore, this phase is incredibly challenging because the sufferer appears to bear no such burden. 
One suffers from no physical symptom or sensation, so no one can tell that he or she is anxious. To deepen your level of understanding, I'll place you in their shoes. You're still very much struggling with the outside world and thoughts that continually frighten you, yet you seem, for all intents and purposes, healthy. You're in your own personal hell, and no one can pull you out because no one realizes you need saving. You're standing right there with others. You're laughing, talking, fuck, you're even cracking jokes. You're the center of attention and people love you, but you don't love you. In fact, you think you've gone insane. You've got no idea why you're constantly worrying about what your best friend thinks of you. What if Sean doesn't like me or, even worse, tells me he does but then makes jokes about being behind my back to all the boys? What if the girl I'm dating dumps me? I know she's standing here with me holding my hand, but what if she, in fact, likes Sean? What if my anxiety goes and I have nothing to worry about? I was faced with every one of these thoughts just as my physical sensations and symptoms regressed. They spun around in my head constantly after schoolies and over the years that followed. Not only did the fear of ghosts, hell and the afterlife increase dramatically, but I had these new fears to deal with too. I'm sure you'll understand what stabbed at my head every minute from the moment I awoke to the moment my head hit the pillow that night. And I can actually remember that, guys. Like, I'd, I'd wake up and, you know, I was ignorant because I wasn't, I, you know, I just didn't remember the anxiety. And then I'd go to the toilet or something would trigger me. And then from then on, it was just like, right, this is, this is what my mind's going to be thinking about from now until I fall asleep again tonight. It was just bizarre. It really was quite bizarre. Writing all this now brings back memories, but also sheds some light on the sort of person I was. I simply did not understand myself and how I reacted to things. I didn't understand what the term anxiety meant, but I do now. Let's pretend you're a lumberjack who's required to cut down a tree. Well, anxiety is like a very large tree with every fearful thought represented by its branches. Now to you, the lumberjack, all those branches, those anxious thoughts are irrelevant. You could cut them, break them in two, squash, hack and saw them all day, but that won't bring the tree down and eventually those pestering branches will grow back. To bring the tree down, you must cut it at its base. Anxiety works a lot like this. If you set out to tackle each unique fear and every anxious thought, you will not prevail. Your goal should be to bring your overall anxiety level down. Cut the tree at its base. This beckons the question, how do I then fight anxiety at its roots? Spoiler alert, you don't fight it. You allow each thought to pass through calmly and without attachment by way of observation. Stay tuned for a deeper insight. Nevertheless, when I figured this out through much trial and error, mind you, my life changed dramatically and completely. I believe that creativity is closely linked with anxiety. Think about it. When you're anxious, everything needs analyzing. You're like a computer taking in new information, feeding it to the motherboard at a million miles per hour. You need to make sense of things faster than you ever did previously. When things already make sense, however, anxiety can take you for a ride and try to analyze them even further. This is when you may find yourself in a seemingly never-ending downward spiral known only as an anxiety loop. From here, it's all just unwanted internal creativity. It's not necessary and it can get very, very frustrating. Is anyone else picturing themselves corkscrewing down a black hole of misery and hopeless mental anguish? Maybe I just got out from the wrong side of the bed this morning, which is impossible because the other side of the bed is adjacent to my bedroom wall. Well, it was back at the time there, guys. I actually live with my girlfriend now. <laughs> Look, it makes no sense. Anyway, here's an example of what I'm describing. You're walking through a furniture store. Oh look, there's a chair. That color is nice. I've always liked the color brown and the design of the chair is nice too, but I probably wouldn't have made it quite like that. I'd have taken one of the legs off and made it a tripod stand type thingy. But wait, imagine if I genuinely did remove one of the legs and sold it to a friend, yet he wanted the original design with four legs, not three. I hope he wouldn't be too mad. Shit. I reckon a three-legged chair would potentially be more dangerous than a four-legged chair. Imagine if someone rocked back on it and hurt themselves. Oh, I couldn't bear it. Fuck, I need to call Luke and make sure he's okay. A few seconds pass. Wait. You take a step back and look at the chair in the store. I don't need to call Luke. I've just gone from zero to a hundred faster than Drake. 
Now that's an anxiety loop. Although I've never become anxious over the possibility of designing a faulty chair, I have had fearful thoughts over other things that are just as insane. In any case, the chair isn't the point. It's the creativity of the mind. The mind has evolved to foresee potentially dangerous scenarios so that we make safe, rational decisions to stay alive. Creativity is so closely linked with anxiety and stress because you need to be able to expect the unexpected. Evolution and natural selection have given us the ability to predict what's around the corner, but despite the benefit of such survival instincts, anxiety has become more of a burden in today's society. We are no longer a primal species. We do not live in such circumstances anymore. Our intellect has progressed far beyond an era where anxiety was not only important, but crucial to our way of life and to our survival. A stressful old genius? I believe that many of the world's greatest artists, thinkers, designers, and innovators were significantly anxious, at least at some point in their lives. If only they knew what anxiety was and how to keep it in check. Ben Franklin once said, Do not anticipate trouble or worry about what may never happen. Keep in the sunlight. He also stated that evils come not, then our fears are vain. And if they do, fear but augments the pain. Clearly, the great man knew what is more commonly known about the subject today. Albert Einstein was also presumed by some specialists to suffer from autism or Asperger's, however speculative it may be. Could a basic understanding of anxiety have helped ease some of the mental ache this exceptional thinker may have endured? Maybe that's a stretch, but maybe it isn't. However, Einstein may not have discovered his general theory of relativity, which changed the world forever. His theories still hold today as humanity's best understanding of the way the universe works. Amazing stuff. So, maybe a certain degree of anxiety does help boost creativity and innovation. In that regard, it would only be fair to say that anxiety is, in practice, a good thing. Does that mean we should look to harness the power of it, not only for its ability to scout out potentially dangerous situations, but also to help us become progressive thinkers, innovators, and entrepreneurs to work towards a global movement for technologically advanced civilizations? Now that is a stretch. I wonder whether these great men and women aforementioned could have achieved what they did without the chip of anxiety on their shoulder. Is happiness linearly disproportional to creativity? Is it that the more anxious you are, the more creative potential you have? Yet, because you are indeed more anxious, the happier you are not. I know that's a pretty big assumption to make, but creativity can be an overwhelming phenomenon. We all know the phrase, ignorance is bliss. There is much credence to this expression, however dull it may seem. In any case, imagine a life with no understanding of suffering. Everything is fine and dandy according to you, and you're just rolling along, laughing and drinking beers with your mates. What a pretty sweet life that would be. I understand there would be little essence to such a life, and for me, I'd feel as though something was missing. I'd feel as though an underlying itch existed that needed scratching, the itch of curiosity. Humans are a curious species, and ignorance, however blissful it may be, suspends that curiosity. There is always a need for critical thinking and reason. There is always a need to be creative. It is one of humanity's most precious characteristics. I believe that anxiety sometimes is necessary in situations outside of keeping us away from danger and not just for creative purposes either. I believe the greatest sportsmen and women, fuck, the greatest people in any facet have a drive outside motivation and determination. These work well, but there could be something stronger. I believe this drive is fear. Fear will push us to the ends of the earth and back. There is no other emotion that stops us dead in our tracks and forces us to think or act like fear does. It is both a heavy motivator and a heavy detriment. We should be aware of what fear is and understand how our fear rises and falls so we fully comprehend when it is necessary and when it is not. So, if happiness is the overall goal in life, not pertaining to something we strive to achieve, moreover something we feel when we sustain a significant degree of fulfillment and personal growth, then our anxiety levels must be closely monitored. 
I dare say, happiness may not be achievable otherwise. I think it is important to comprehend when fear helps promote creativity and growth and when it negates it. I believe this should be of both individual and societal concern. Stream of consciousness, end. I remember a time some close mates and I were drinking. We were gearing ourselves up for a big night. This night was going to be an epic on any biblical scale. We had finished university for the year. Well, I had anyway. We had the following morning off, work that is, and had two 21st parties to attend. There was also nothing more that really needed planning. We knew which 21st we'd head to first, how to get to the second one when it came time, and we had transport organized to the city. We got right into it. It still remains to this day the most aggressive pre-drinks I've ever been to. This was going to be the session of all sessions. I digress for a moment. In early 2017, Mum and I went to a cafe to hang out and do some work on a Saturday morning. We got chatting once the motivation for productivity died off, within the first 15 minutes that is. We reflected over my personal journey into adulthood and she, at one point, questioned whether the talks with my psychologist reduced my anxiety or was it more to do with my undying quest for self-discovery, which allowed the processes and tools to be put in place to alleviate the symptoms. And I said it was both. If I hadn't received counselling, I would not have been open to change. I didn't know who I was. I wasn't aware something needed changing. However, in retrospect, the need for change was significant. My whole life before and immediately after the trip, my experience on schoolies eating the mushrooms, revolved around the prospect of playing AFL at the highest level. That was the only thing important to me. I recall planning my summer around the national draft pick. You have to be selected to go, even though I was not even being looked at. It was an anxiety thing. Once I made it to the AFL, then I would get all the girls, the money, the fame, and life would be great. Then I could relax. I was in my own head. This is the sort of thing I used to tell myself. I was chasing what I thought happiness would be, and I knew playing footy at the highest level would get me there. I did not understand what life was all about the everyday, and not the finish line. It sounds cliched, but it's true. There were also other gaps which needed to be satisfied in my life. Although I was young, I disregarded certain aspects in my life that were necessary in attaining balance. Hanging out with friends, going out every so often, and playing guitar were all pushed aside for footy, and, although I was unaware, it was eating away at me from the inside. Maybe some of the negativity associated with that trip was my subconscious mind noting my fall off the rails, albeit in an ostensibly healthy way. Hey Tom, Tom, you're swaying from who you are, mate. Remember your mates? Your love of guitar, the jokes and fun times? Where's the balance in your life? What's happened to all that? Maybe this is what I would have discovered if I'd meditated in the lead up to the hallucinations in that little bedroom. Nevertheless, I am now where I want to be and need to be. I am happier and more personally in tune than ever before. So, back to the big night. I remember before we left, we were playing Jenga with huge wooden blocks. I took out a block and it unfortunately brought the tower down. I had to scale my drink. Those were the rules. Although discouraged, I put it back with one swig. I will never, ever forget the taste. The boys, specifically Luke, don't think I forget that, mate, had mixed it up with all the spirits and wonders of the world, and it went down horribly and sent me over the edge. I was completely fucked. I hardly remember getting into the taxi outside the house, and the drive to the 21st, the first 21st that was, was rough. I was so drunk. Yeah, but wasn't it awesome? (laughs) No. There's a level of intoxication which is fun, and then there's where I was at. I don't know, some people can do it, but I couldn't, especially considering my chronic state of mind at the time. As we drove to the party, I became increasingly anxious. I almost felt fuzzy. I don't know what brought it on, but the horrendous panic attack that followed was a result of hating the feeling of not being in control. That sounds like a familiar story, doesn't it? I had been drunk like this before, but it never occurred to me there was a danger in something going sour. This time was different. I hated the feeling. These days, I understand that's precisely why I couldn't shake the feeling. One of my closest mates, Sean, experienced similar anxiety when in Las Vegas. He feared something would go horribly wrong at a party 
whilst in a taxi on his way there. The fear became worse and worse. It wasn't long before his fear turned into sheer panic. He'd been drinking too, and from what I understand, alcohol doesn't help. However, the underlying factor is the anxiety. It's amazing how closely related the two examples are, and I'm sure many others have experienced the fear of not being in control. Not being in control of a situation, alcohol or no alcohol, gives way to risk, and risk is present in everything we do. There is a certain degree of uncertainty that exists in every situation. Control or certainty shouldn't always matter. If there was no risk in anything you did, and you always had complete control, then there would be no learning by doing. We learn from our actions. Without risk, there is no reward, and it is frustrating to me that so many people worry unnecessarily about control in their lives, given the primitive nature of having no control, which is ingrained in all of us as a species. That said, I understand this is somewhat hypocritical of me, given the specific panic attack I am referring to related to that very worry. This is yet again another example of the equally fascinating and frustrating patterns that exist within a generalized anxiety disorder. By the time we reached the party, I was yet again in a state of panic, engrossed in the belief that I was trapped inside my own head, no control whatsoever. When we got out of the taxi, I looked at Luke with a horrified expression. He immediately understood what was happening. Luke walked me down a side street to a nearby park. We'll catch up with you guys in a sec, he said. We sat down and I proceeded to tell him what was happening. Luke is a great friend and listener, and although he's never experienced anxiety like this, touch wood, with all the panic attacks, etc., he gets how my mind works. It's always reassuring to discuss things like this with him. Mate, I'm so sorry. I feel like a fucking goose for saying this, but I just feel trapped. I feel like God is going to send me to hell and I'll get tortured for eternity. Dude, I'm not even that religious, but I can't get it out of my head. I'm, I'm panicking for even swearing right now because I know he hates that shit. And plus, I, I swear I have schizophrenia. I keep hearing voices telling me to watch out for the people texting me. Before long, I burst into tears. Luke could see my anxiety attack wasn't going anywhere. He thought it best to get me in a taxi as soon as possible and head home. I agreed. I was more than happy to get out of that situation, even though deep down, I knew there was no escape from my internal distress. In any case, I just wanted to crawl into the confines of my bed and sleep it off. I was happy to give in to the anxiety that night. I'd later find out the night had been a huge success, with the boys taking away some seriously great memories. Both 21st parties were apparently insane, and the whole crew had tons of fun. Although I, still to this day, feel a little envious I missed out, Something was brewing in me that needed addressing, and it needed to take priority that night. That something, I'd later find out, was my heightened anxiety state, bringing about aggressively severe obsessive compulsions. However, at the time, I thought that was all normal and a mere phase in life. The taxi ride home was awful. I couldn't wait to get out of the car. I remember when I finally did, I ran inside and slammed shut my bedroom door. Dad was home and couldn't believe how quickly the night had flown by. He asked sarcastically, Good night? But I didn't respond. He quickly realized it had not been. I can count the number of times on one hand I have cried in my life. The first was when my parents told my sister and I they were getting divorced. The second was at the end of Benjamin Button. That movie really struck a nerve. And the third was when my mum got remarried. I have never seen her so happy and giggly, quite like a little schoolgirl. I was overwhelmed with emotion. The final time was this night. On the surface, I had a fear of uncertainty, and the compulsions and panic were bubbling below, about to erupt from their depths. In retrospect, I deem this night the tip of the iceberg. It was a necessary defeat, and the first of many along my journey to find internal peace. I burst into tears again as soon as Dad walked in my room to see what the matter was. He could see I was in a state of both panic and extreme intoxication. He comforted me by asking simple, easy-to-respond-to questions. He was, and always will be, a sensational listener. And that was all that I needed. I just had to talk and get whatever was spinning around upstairs out and into the open, and Dad understood that. At one point, he mentioned he used to suffer from similar sensations and thoughts as well. We'll come to that. I recall a vision I had that night, 
similar to when I saw mum shaking her head at me with disapproval when I was tripping, which rocked me to my core. I closed my eyes with dad still in the room and saw a vision of myself trapped behind bars within my own head. Now, a lot of this had to do with how intoxicated I was. I understand that, but the underlying issues were there and needed addressing. My lack of self-awareness didn't help either. I did not know who I was, and therefore did not know how to lead a personally successful life. Looking back, I see these seemingly insignificant things can negatively ripple into bigger issues and cause anxiety spikes as they did with me. Back to my room. I yelled out, on repeat mind you, Get it out! Get it out! Get it out! Get it out! Dad wasn't too sure what to do, but like I said, his presence was all I needed. For those of you lucky enough never to have experienced a panic attack, let me paint a picture. Panic attacks make you feel like the world is going to end. Every physical sensation is preparing you for the worst and you are stuck in a constant state of worry. Panic attacks represent the most severe manifestation of high anxiety and, evolutionarily speaking, when you experience one, your mind literally thinks you are about to die. It is evolution's best answer for keeping you alive and safe. Everything is telling you to vacate the premises because everything thinks you're in peril danger. This is why they are so fucking unbearable. This is why it is true bravery going against what your anxiety is telling you. In a way, you're facing death. The panic attack on this night was no different. The trapped vision scared me to bits. It was the first of many panic attacks that really shook me. I'd experienced them previously, but none like this. These attacks questioned my values, identity, and everything I thought I knew about the world. I felt so unbelievably vulnerable. They were chipping away at my soul. No wonder I started to question whether or not I had a serious mental illness. The culmination of that night, the tip of the iceberg, was an epic vomiting session. I vomited all over my bed and into a towel Dad brought in for me. He must have guessed what was about to happen. Dad had now seen me with both shit and vomit all over the place. Refer to chapter 2. What a lovely gentleman I grew up to be. I passed out not long after and slept through the night. Needless to say, the following day wasn't overly productive. How good is old-fashioned alcohol poisoning? I needed help. Something was up and it was impacting my life a great deal. Three years prior... I had been to a psychologist named Michael, but it was in dealing with footy-related issues. He was a sports psychologist and used to help me with on- and off-field performance. I didn't get much out of it because at the time, I struggled to open up about my issues. Fast forward to 2014, and I felt like I had no choice but to open up. I was on the ropes. The stakes were far greater. I needed help. Michael is a dead-set legend. He's a fantastic listener and I cherished the time we spoke together, even if he was getting paid for it. The second time I went to see Michael, things were different. The first time, I was worried my injured knee would never heal, and I wanted to put some pre-game strategies in place so that I would be prepared for each footy match. This time, I wanted to speak to Michael because I had developed OCD, forcing me to pick up rubbish off the ground every day. I couldn't sleep at night for fear of demonic attacks, and I was scared shitless that I may somehow find the people closest to me sexually attractive. Intrusive sexual thoughts are quite common among people with high levels of anxiety. And I actually think that, uh, I think it's something like 1% of the standard population can develop an OCD issue, and approximately 10% of those sufferers with OCD will develop sexually intrusive thoughts. So... It was uh, a little uncommon, but that was um, that's what I had, so it's all good. <laughs> I spent most days in my room watching Friends as it provided a light-hearted escape from reality. In fact, looking back on what I just wrote there, that I mean, clearly that was an addiction because I needed to escape my suffering. Like I said, things were different. By this stage, I felt like I'd gone mad. Everything frightened me. I wasn't myself, and I was losing touch with reality. It's an unnerving feeling walking down a cobblestone road into a place called the Mind Room to talk to a complete stranger about your deepest fears and darkest, most personally terrifying thoughts. I was a vulnerable human being. 
I always thought I was someone who could easily ask for help, but walking in to speak to Michael for the first time was incredibly challenging. I felt emasculated. Guys weren't supposed to speak about all this shit. What do you mean you've seen yourself burn in a fire in hell with demons poking at you? No wonder you think you've got no mates. It was tough to come to terms with the fact I wasn't healthy. Mental ill health is challenging because no one knows you've got an issue unless you tell them. It's hard for people to pick up on your affliction because to outsiders, you're asymptomatic. For all intents and purposes, I was a fit and ambitious football player that trained every day and had a great set of mates. And if I do say say so myself, I'm probably at least a 6 out of 10. Strong 6, you know, uh, weak 6, probably a strong 5. How could I be sick? Well, I was. What no one knew was that my love of footy had become an obsession for fear of not making it to the AFL. It was also a means of escape from the shitstorm I called life. I was shown into a quiet room when I finally plucked up the courage to walk through the doors. I sat down in a comfortable chair. Michael turned to face me. It's good to see you again, Tom, he said sympathetically. I didn't respond. Although I knew what he meant, I certainly wasn't happy to see him again. Nowadays, I find it quite easy to talk about the issues and thoughts I was struggling with, then because they are no longer issues. I've accepted them for what they were. Back in early 2014, it was no easy task. I mentioned the hell thing first. It wasn't as challenging for me to talk about an irrational fear like this compared to talking about the possibility of entering a sexual relationship with stupid sexy Ned Flanders wearing nothing at all from The Simpsons, a genuine fear of mine at the time. Again, anxiety doesn't necessarily have to make sense. Michael began writing down various things, I'd say, and he also asked some more general questions about my lifestyle habits. Are you a smoker? Do you exercise? Do you take recreational drugs? That sort of thing. It wasn't as vanilla as that, by the way. This dude had style. Jeez, that was probably over the top there. (laughs) We started talking about when these fears developed and why they were so intense. One of the first things you learn as an anxiety sufferer is how to act. Forget drama classes. If you've got something going on upstairs, you're on a one-way express train to Hollywood. In any case, you'll learn to keep a straight face when the waters turn murky. I say keep your money. Forget those fucking drama classes. Michael, clearly an expert in scouting out these sorts of actors, prodded me into coming clean about my recreational drug use and general level of stress. Lying in bed at night worrying about fire and brimstone isn't exactly normal, is it? But what was normal? I didn't know. It was in that first counselling session I discovered that my fears were very much my own and that something had been brewing deep down for a while. Maybe the events on schoolies, along with the changes in lifestyle and transition into adulthood, were merely the catalysts. In fact, I'm almost certain that's what they were. I also learnt about the sheer commonality of generalised anxiety disorders in society. I'm sure you've all seen the billboards, One in four people are clinically diagnosed, and I'm that little voice in your head, and so on. We all know anxiety is extremely common, but I hadn't really grasped the concept until I spoke to Michael. It's reassuring when you find out you're not alone. Anxiety is such an aggressively personal thing, and it's hard to see past it sometimes. That night, I wrote in my diary. I must again reiterate the invaluable tool that is diary writing. It is helpful talking to someone and have them make sense of what may or may not be whirling around in your amygdala, the part of your brain responsible for the perception of stressful emotions, but coming to your own senses is priceless. Writing it down in words clears the fog, opens the windows and frees up all the bullshit so you can locate exactly where the stress lies. Sometimes it is hard to come to terms with the root issue, but if you're not into meditation and looking for something that works in a similar fashion, Diary writing may be the tool for you. 28th of January, 2014. G'day, Tom. I went back to Michael today and spoke to him about all the shit that's been happening of late. I feel like I'm going insane. I used to be a fun dude to be around, and now I'm stuck. I'm going through life with the glass sheet in front of my eyes. I can see what's happening. I can feel it and talk but I'm always looking back at myself through that glass sheet. It's a mirror. I can't stop analysing myself. I can't stop thinking about sexuality, death, and mental illnesses 
and the social anxiety is difficult to endure. I don't get it. I never had this before. Deep down, I know I like girls, I won't go to hell, and I don't have schizophrenia, but I'm trapped in an internal jail of fear. The questions Michael asked me today sent me into an intense state of panic, that of which I've been unable to shake even until now. Logically, I can see I've got an anxiety issue, but physically I'm fine. I don't know. I'm confused and afraid, and I don't have the energy for anything. Last Friday, I chose to stay home and watch a movie instead of going to Louis 21st because I was too tired. What a fucking crock of shit. It's been a rough day. Tom Ted signing out. Watching all the movies about mental health and various psychological thrillers as a kid, I thought that once you accepted you had an anxiety disorder and spoke about the issues at hand, they'd all go away. I thought that when you finally gave in, everything would be sweet, but that is not the case. It takes time to alter a habitually anxious mindset. You literally have to see the world in a different way because the way you're seeing it doesn't coincide with who you're supposed to be. It had taken 21 years for me to develop one and I was beginning to realize this would be no overnight project. The first day talking to Michael was tough. I felt like I'd opened a can of worms. These worms slithered around in my brain and forced me to do and think things I never had before. They say your brain goes through its last stages of development between the ages of 18 to 23. So, irrespective of my anxiety, I was changing as a person. I was becoming a man. 2014 was the roughest year of my life and therefore the most important. It was the most challenging. It changed me and tested all my strength. I was diagnosed with a significant generalized anxiety disorder and OCD with panic disorder. I felt I had no purpose in life after failing to make the VFL, a grade of footy below the AFL and something I had devoted my life to. Furthermore, My sister was going through her own personal struggles, which through no fault of her own made family life incredibly unsettling. My parents were finalizing their divorce, which added to the tensions around the house, and a relative of mine was in rehab for heroin and meth addiction. My relative and I are very similar, and his state at the time frightened me beyond belief. What if he didn't get any better? What if I became addicted to drugs? What if, what if, what if? My sister and I were brought up in the best way possible. We went to fantastic schools, we had great friends, we had parents who loved us and we loved them. It was the perfect upbringing. But 2014 was the year the ground fell from underneath us. All the certainties in our lives, the assurances and the rocks that supported us broke apart. Personally, I had no confidence with anything. I'd always had footy to escape to, but that came crashing down when I found out I wasn't good enough even for the backup grade. Fuck. That's how I saw it back then. I could always rely on my parents for advice, but that fell apart when I realized they couldn't even keep their own relationship growing. I was experiencing a complete mental breakdown. It's interesting to note the connection between ego and anxiety. Anxiety is inward fearful thinking. It obsesses over the individual with the burden. Anxiety is therefore, by definition, a self-centered emotion. Although I was severely anxious, in retrospect, I see that all the worrying and compulsions were based around my own life and not the lives of others. What I'm trying to say is that it was all about me, and that viewpoint sucks. Dad was depressed. Mum's close friends were being diagnosed left, right, and center with cancer. My sister was in hospital, and yet here I was, obsessing over irrational thoughts, all whilst my family battled very real, very tangible personal difficulties. You know... It's good to include a little quote here. And I think one of the greatest, if you're struggling to try to find yourself, you know, which is kind of like a bit of a fatty type thing to say these days, but that's true. If you, if you are struggling to find yourself, and I think we become ourselves, we don't necessarily find ourselves. But Mahatma Gandhi said, you find yourself by giving yourself to the service of others. So if you're constantly worrying about yourself, like I was back then, something you can do is just try to be there for other people. And you're going to start to you're going to start to find out who you are and what makes you tick, not only because you're actually sacrificing time, to which you can then think how you'd actually rather use your time, but actually because you're helping other people, which is, it's an innate, I don't know, I don't think it's like a biological thing, but like it's a, it's almost like a, a metaphysical or symbolic thing for, uh, for us humans. And, you know, we all know it feels good. 
Yes, I understood they had their own demons, but that was purely because they told me. I held little to no empathy for their struggles, as I believed mine were worse. I could not escape the trap of my own anxious mindset. Hence, the development of depressive thoughts came about from this realization I couldn't relate to my family's suffering. My sense of community and belonging had gone. From January 2014, I spoke to Michael frequently over the next five months. I was at my most vulnerable. From the 28th of January to the 19th of June, I received professional help, which I think was hard for me to admit at the time. It is never easy to ask for help, and although I strongly contend that anxiety can be greatly reduced by certain methods, counselling is nevertheless a fantastic starting point. I look at counselling like I look at a band-aid. In the beginning, it provides excellent support because it helps you understand how your anxiety has manifested and the steps you can take to prevent it from manifesting further. However, in the end, the buck stops with you. There comes a time when you must rip the band-aid off and let the wound heal on its own. Counseling acts as an incredibly important guide for your fingers, but you are the one who will ultimately play the piano. Your mind is yours, as is your state of mind. Essentially, it's up to you. That's what's arduous and exciting about all this. Changing how you perceive your thoughts, let alone your reality, is difficult, but that change carries over into all aspects of life. We must learn how our emotions are influenced when they're rational and when they serve no purpose. The anxiety emotion is no different from any other. It is like a switch, setting itself to different levels, depending on certain life factors and internal factors for that matter. Learning how our emotions rise and fall in response to thoughts and cues is vital for our well-being. Counseling was also difficult because, with hindsight, my anxiety actually got worse before it got better. I finally felt safe enough to open up. I felt comfortable enough to explore and observe what lay hidden in my mind down the rabbit hole. This was a place I'd barely ventured, if at all. It was a frightening place. It seemed I was beginning to understand why I was so boisterous and loud and why I'd been referred to as the class clown for so many years. It's because I'd learnt how to self-distract. By understanding more about myself and how I reacted to things in everyday life, I became more aware of potential dangers behind every corner. What do you mean by that, Tom? Well, by talking to Michael, I learnt that I am someone who constantly needs to be busy. I maintain that boredom should never be a part of anyone's life, as there is so much to do and so much to live for. As Dad always used to say, we need to find you something to do or you'll start climbing up the walls. I run at a million miles an hour. It is both my most loved and most hated quality. If I do not put the right processes in place, boredom will manifest itself and my anxiety will rise. Just reading that last bit when I wrote something like, I learned that I'm someone who constantly needs to be busy, I agree with that to a degree, but I also kind of believe now that I don't need anything and I don't think anyone needs anything to feel whole. And if I, obviously at the time, I felt like I needed to be busy all the time, probably meant that I couldn't be fine and happy and alone just by myself with my thoughts. So that's when meditation can come in and really provide a lot of help for us. Your brain without external stimulation, begins to look inside itself for jobs and tasks to complete. Your brain is the most energy-consuming muscle in the body. It demands tasks. It needs to accomplish things. If not, it will come up with its own tasks, and that's when it can get creative. This is why I love self-development so much. Self-development is the understanding that life is a journey, and that journey never stops. I don't ever want to stop growing as a person in any life aspect. I hope to never be totally satisfied with my life because I love the idea of improving it. Humanity has always pushed its boundaries and this stemmed from the willingness to never accept what is. It is in our blood to self-develop and to evolve for the better. In learning about yourself, you become aware of how you react to things. And when I became aware or mindful, as meditators call it, I being one, although by no means a monk, I noticed many detrimental lifestyle habits I subconsciously had in place. I used to love wasting hours by the TV, staying up late, not doing anything productive, and I had no purpose. I could not answer the why with many of my daily habits. Playing the guitar was probably the only thing that kept me mentally active, and yet I had no idea why I enjoyed it. It was just something I used to do. 
It seemed like I had no purpose, or if I did, I couldn't tell anyone what it was. I couldn't describe it. I was keeping busy, but not in the right way. Nevertheless, the understanding of this became apparent within my counselling sessions with Michael. Yes, I understand all that, Tom, but why did your anxiety get worse if you were beginning to get a grip on life? It's because it takes time for people to change, and whenever I'd recognise a bored moment, old mate Gary upstairs would scurry for his microphone and begin yelling out hypothetical scenarios in my ears. What if you stay bored for too long and have a panic attack? What if you start scrolling the TV and notice some bloke you find attractive? Would you want to get with him? What if you don't find something to do today and God becomes aware of this, then marks you off his list into heaven because you're not being productive? Why don't you have a girlfriend? Why don't you have a girlfriend? Why don't you have a girlfriend? Loser. Fucking loser. Loser. I didn't know how to respond. This continued for the next two years.